Well, hello everyone and welcome again to uh, our discussion group of The Fountainhead. This week, uh, coming from the Ayn Rand Institute, we're going to be talking about part four, chapters one through ten. This is our second to last reading and my colleague at the Institute, Paul Task, Taskey, will join me uh, momentarily. But uh, first, I want to actually run through just a few quick announcements about this group and about other opportunities uh, related to it. So first of all, if you are watching us on social media, either on Facebook or on YouTube, that's great. Uh, but if you'd like to be able to interact with us more directly, the best way to do that is through Zoom. And I put up here on the, uh, on the screen the URL uh, for you to register for, uh, for participating through Zoom, where you'll be able to ask us questions directly, also make uh, chat comments. Uh, also, part of the reason that we're doing this discussion series is because the Ayn Rand Institute sponsors uh, the world's largest uh, essay contest about The Fountainhead, among other novels by Ayn Rand. Uh, there are some big cash prizes. Top prize is $10,000. There's also some, uh, there's also some uh, second and uh, uh, third place prizes as well. The deadline for that is May 28th which is coming up soon. Uh, part of the reason why that uh, we want to do this is to get people ready uh, to write essays. And there's going to be about a week between our final session and, a, and the deadline for the contest. Um, and we're getting pretty close. So uh, the deadline is May 28th. Uh, I put the URL for the essay contests at the top of the screen as well. So please check that out if you are interested also, if you, if you like learning more about Ayn Rand's novels and about her ideas, another great resource you can check out is the Ayn Rand University app. This is available for free through your Google Play Store, through your iOS App Store. It contains hundreds of hours of content about Ayn Rand and her ideas and her novels by, uh, by her and by uh, many of her leading students uh, and um, expositors. I have an announcement also about the schedule for the current discussion group, which is going to have some uh, implications for other opportunities. So we've been meeting every Friday, uh, but next Friday we're going to take a break for just one week. And that's because the uh, next weekend is also the time uh, for Ocon Live. This is the uh, Objective, the yearly objectivist conference, which is happening online this year because we know many people uh, are unable to travel. Uh, so if you are interested in learning even more about uh, objectivist ideas, about Ayn Rand's ideas from today's leading experts on her philosophy, you might want to check this out. Uh, there is a fee, but it's going to be a two day online conference with really rich, uh, interesting material centered around the theme of living a life of purpose. Uh, which certainly is a theme that relates to a lot of the ideas uh, in the Fountainhead. You can find out more about that at einrand.org slash Ocon Live. Um, and actually, I didn't put up a, uh, didn't put up, a, oh, well, one other announcement about the schedule is that uh, because we're skipping the uh, regularly scheduled Fountainhead discussion group for next week, that will then resume the following week, May 22nd, Friday, May 22nd, that will be the last date. And then uh, we're actually going to make that a two hour session so that we can first of all, in the first hour, talk about the final reading. And then in the second hour, look at a whole uh, bunch of collected Q&A, uh, collected questions that we've gotten from you over the past few weeks, and then hopefully provide some answers and take new ones uh, if you want to ask them. Okay, so with that, I'm going to bring in my colleague, Paul. Paul, are you out there? Hi, Ben. Good to be back. Good to have you. So there's just a lot of interesting stuff that happens in this second to last reading. And I think you wanted to start off by giving us a quick recap of the major events uh, of part four, chapters one through 10. Yeah. So in case anyone is joining us now without having reread the first half of this section, uh, let me give you a bit of a recap. So Howard Rourke, we start out seeing that he is in the midst of completing Monadnock Valley, a, uh, a resort project. Um, 
and it's the completion of this project gives him some more prominence in the field. It's kind of a return for him from the seclusion we saw in part three of smaller projects. This is contrasted with the March of the Centuries project, which was built by committee headed by Peter Keating, which turned out to be somewhat of a disaster. Um, Gail Wynand meets Howard Work for the first time and asks him to build him a personal residence. He wants it to be a temple to Dominique Wynand. When Work finally submits the design for, Ronan, for Wynand's home, he tries to break Work as he had with so many others, but Work doesn't break. Uh, he said, Rourke says that he has an ally he could trust, and that's Wynan's integrity. After, uh, after Wynan approves the project and moves, and moves into the phases of constructing the home, he forbids Tui from writing about Rourke in his column. Rourke and Wynan start a friendship, and it's not dissimilar to the way we saw Wynan and Dominique's appreciation for each other grow in part three. We see again that Tui's sphere of influence is continuing to grow. And we see dissatisfaction among some of his uh, crew and cronies with the banner. But Tui tells them to wait, not do anything about the banner just yet. Keating, we see, is in decline professionally and even physically. Keating goes to Tui in a di last ditch attempt to try and secure the Cortland Homes project. And Tui says that if uh, Keating can submit something to the specifications of the project that he would be glad to advocate for him, but Keating can't do it. Uh, so Keating turns to Rourke to try and get this project going. Um, and Rourke actually agrees once again to help Keating so long as Rourke's designs are unaltered. Rourke agrees to design the entire project. He won't reveal that he was involved in it so long as his designs aren't changed and Keating and uh, Rourke form a contract to that effect. Wynan begins plugging Rourke and securing commissions for him, giving him publicity in the banner. And the, the last chapter that we read, Keating meets up again with Catherine. The two catch up, but Catherine has changed somehow and this unsettles Keating. Uh, and that's where we leave off. Good, yeah, it's, uh, you know, when I picked this selection of reading, it was mainly because we had to have eight sections of reading and this was roughly halfway between part four, but it turns out there's a lot of thematic unity in just this first half of the reading. And I don't know if that's on purpose or what, but well, it's something we're gonna talk more about. Uh, Paul, one of the questions that we posted earlier for people to discuss was about one of the most pivotal moments in this reading, which is the meeting of Rourke and Wynan. It's something that a lot of the events have been building up to. And part of what's dramatic about it is that you don't quite expect to happen what happens. Uh, they uh, develop a friendship. And so one of the questions we asked was, what does Wynan see in Rourke and what does Rourke see in Wynan? Uh, and then something we'll talk about a little bit later is why doesn't Wynan end up treating Rourke the way he's treated other men of integrity? So I, I know you wanted to start with a few things. Yeah, I had, a, I had just a couple of things here. And, the, and one thing is just that their meeting is unlike any other meeting between two characters we see in the book, where time literally freezes for both of them while they stand there seeing each other. It, you know, it seems like they're just stuck in that moment of, this is who this person is. This is the creator of every building that I went around the country and saw that I liked. And for Rourke, this is the man responsible for the New York banner, that thing that I've, you know, heard so much about and kind of loathed my entire professional career. Um, so, so their meeting is very interesting, but we phrase this question in terms of why does Wine and try or choose not to treat Rourke the same as everyone else but doesn't he try to treat Rourke the same to a certain extent? He tries to break Rourke just like everybody else, but it's Rourke's response that's different. Rourke doesn't allow himself to be broken. Uh, did you want to comment on that? Well, thing? I would say you're right that he tries to treat Rourke the same way, uh, but even from the very beginning, I mean, as you mentioned, there's something momentous happening when they, when they first meet 
And so maybe leading up to the meeting, it was fully Winan's intention to, I mean, I think it was really just his intention to have an architecture deal. But the, as soon as they see each other, Winan knows that something's going to be different. Um, I mean, you mentioned that the way he puts it is that, is that, or the way it's described is that time sort of stops. I mean, it's more than that. Take a look uh, at, at the meeting. This is on, um, which page is it? Uh, I lost it for a moment. I had it before. It's page 516. Wynand was not certain that he missed a moment, that he did not rise at once as courtesy demanded, but remained seated, looking at the man who entered. Perhaps he had risen immediately and it only seemed to him that a long time preceded his movement. Rourke was not certain that he stopped when he entered the office, that he did not walk forward, but stood looking at the man behind the desk. Perhaps there had been no break in his steps and it only seemed to him that he had stopped. But there had been a moment when both forgot the terms of immediate reality. Uh, when Wynan forgot his purpose in summoning this man, when Rourke forgot that this man was Dominique's husband, when no door sketch or sketch of desk or sketch of carpet existed, only the two awarenesses were each of the man before him, only two thoughts meeting in the middle of the room. This is Gail Wynand. This is Howard Rourke. I mean, Paul, it's not just that time has stopped. It's like this is love at first sight. Uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, the closest thing that we have in uh, English idiom to describe what's going on here is the beginning of a bromance. Uh, but that's not sufficient idiom because it's usually something that's used tongue in cheek. And Ayn Rand is quite serious about the fact that there's a, that there's a kind of love at first sight here. That's a non-sexual love, but it's uh, at least as far as we can tell, but it's uh, everything about love that we know uh, from Wynan's perspective is starting to fall into place here. I mean, for people who are following in the chat, do you remember what is it that Wynand has always, how is it that Wynand has always described love? What is his kind of rule of thumb is sort of, you know, what what does love mean according to, to, to Wynand? And already in the chat, we have several people. Elizabeth says an exception. Grant says exception making. And Paul, you already brought up some of this, but I mean, what Wynan begins to do for Rourke on numerous accounts is to make all kinds of exceptions. He immediately, when they meet, says, starts saying things that he doesn't mean to say. Later, he says, no one's ever caused him to become so obvious. That's page 528. Uh, Rourke offers to help Wynan end his pain with the world and Wynan says before he, before meeting Rourke, he would have murdered anybody who offered such help. He's obviously not offering to do that for Rourke. Um, there's immediate effects of his uh, meeting Rourke on how he operates the banner. He starts killing the, the, the worst of the editorials that Skerritt and Fogler are writing. He fires Dwight Carson, who is the guy previously he had tried to break because he was a man of integrity and succeeded. And now it seems like he doesn't want this broken person on the staff anymore. He even tells Tui not to write about Rourke and tells his play paper actually to go ahead and plug Rourke. So uh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, I, I should also mention this whole sequence features not just love between Rourke and Wynand, but a love triangle. <laughs> We could talk more about the particulars of this, but it's a very unique love triangle because it's not that Rourke and Wynand are both competing for Dominique. It's that Dominique and Wynand are both competing for Rourke and there's jealousy, and but it's a weird kind of benevolent jealousy. Uh, so there's something very unique uh, in, in literature going on here. Um, so the big question then is, why do they feel this way uh, toward each other? And I think mostly what we get is 
a sense of Winan's attitude toward Rourke. We don't get so much uh, internal psychologically from Rourke with respect to Winan. Um, but uh, we asked this question and Gretchen posted an answer on Facebook and she said, Rourke, sorry, she said, Winan sees in Rourke another man like himself. It's interesting that they started life in similar circumstances of poverty and struggle, yet became so different in how they live their lives. Wine and Rourke and Dominique all value ability in man and each handles it differently. And yeah, I think that uh, there's a lot in what Gretchen is saying there. And I see she's uh, also joined us in the chat and she says, is it love or is it recognition? Well, Gretchen, I think the, the two go hand in hand uh, in this case. Uh, I mean, I, I assume that you would certainly agree that there's a, a highly positive emotional response that Wynan has toward Rourke, though it's a very complex one for reasons that we'll discuss. Um, is that love? Well, it's not sexual love in a, any obvious way, but uh, it, it, it certainly has, it's more than just liking the guy. It's more than just being his pal. It's even like it's even more than just plain friendship, uh, especially since the two of these people had expected to be at, uh, at war with each other in one way or another. Um, it's, part, it's important to stress the complexity too, because it's not just that Wynan sees in Rourke another version of himself. He actually has a really unique way of putting this on page 542. He says, I always feel as if I were reading to you a carbon copy of myself and you've already seen the original. You seem to hear everything I say a minute in advance. We're unsynchronized. So he sees a similarity between the two of them, but it's amidst a background of various kinds of differences. Uh, it's almost as if he sees Rourke as a more pure version of himself. And uh, the kitten uh, comparison that he makes at one point is notable here. He compares Rourke to a kitten who has no conception of the world's ugliness. And it's comforting to Rourke. Though at the same time, there's something painful about it. Page 547, he says, it hurts him to think of Rourke, but the hurt actually helps him in a certain way. And the hurt probably has something to do with knowledge of the differences in their outlook, uh, the different kinds of choices uh, that he's made. Uh, and that I think relates to some of the issues uh, about why he tries to break Rourke and why he doesn't. And Paul, I know you wanted to say things about that. Well, just before we move on to those points, just two other things that I think might be interesting for people to recall from last time was that Winans view of Rourke seems very similar to that uh, view we got from Stephen Mallory of viewing Rourke as someone who could live forever, someone who was unchanging. And then also um, back to the exception making that Wynand is making for Rourke in this case by you know accepting him and not uh, trying to break him any further after Rourke refuses to be broken the first time. He's made the exception already by meeting Rourke in person, which is the same thing he did with Dominique after he saw the statue of her. He typically doesn't like to meet the models or the sculptors or people who made them. And so the same could be said for architects. He wouldn't yeah. want to meet Rourke, but he does right. anyway. So then the question becomes, why is it that once he, once he meets and once he discovers that Rourke is like some of the other men of integrity he has met, or at least known about, and tries to break him, but doesn't. Um, and Gretchen uh, in the comment section of Facebook suggested an answer. She said, Rourke shows him what, would, what it would mean to look like to redraw the Winand house uh, as Winand would have him redraw the others. The visual reality is more than Winand can take. Um, I think that's an important part of the answer here. Uh, it, he wants this house so badly that uh, he can't stand what it would mean. Now, there's always been a question in my mind, well, isn't what he's demanding here that it be designed as it was designed, but the, the, the deal is going to be he's going to make Rourke use bad design for all the rest of the buildings. And that might be true, but 
even still, there's more going on here than just the design of the building. It's also the way that Rourke reacts to the threat. Rourke doesn't seem afraid. Uh, he doesn't even seem angry. He, I, he's described as reacting gaily with essentially with laughter at, right. at Winan's request. He says, sure, that's easy. I could do that. Anyone could. Right. And then he immediately dashes off a, what's described as a serious drawing in good taste of what anyone would describe as, of what any professor would deem respectable. But it's certainly not, you know, the, the quintessential Rourke building that Winan respects so well. In other words, Rourke is responding with a joke, which means he can't take this kind of threat seriously, which means that he doesn't fear the, the, uh, the consequences. He doesn't fear the humiliation that Wynand is threatening him with. And this is the big way they differ. If you, th if you think back to our previous discussion of why it is that Wynand wants power over people. He wants it because he doesn't want to be the sucker because he is afraid of their laughter. But here's Rourke, not only not afraid, but laughing at it himself. And there are a couple of questions that people submitted that I think relate to this point too. Um, Gretchen submitted a question to ask why, uh, Wynan asks why Rourke do doesn't hate his guts as a reaction to everything the banner said about him. Rourke says he doesn't hate him. He's not angry, but Dominique was angry. How can Rourke be indifferent to what was written negatively about him while Dominique cannot? Well, this is the same issue. It's the fact that the pain only goes down to a certain point for Rourke, that he doesn't fundamentally care about the way the world reacts to him and so isn't afraid of it. But Wynand has been, Dominique has been. And that's then uh, part of why uh, it's part of why there's, there's an exchange, which I had cut from the notes, where Wynand is acting as if he wants forgiveness from Rourke for the Stoddard Temple affair. And Rourke says, no, it's not really forgiveness from me that you want. And he implies that what he really needs is forgiveness uh, by himself, from himself, because not only of this mistake, but of the very different way of reacting to the world that he has. Gretchen also asked a question about why does Rourke's indifference frighten Wynan more than his anger would have? Is it that Wynan has to then face his own judgment rather than someone else's? And I think that's exactly the case. So uh, it's not just the drawing, it's, it's, it's seeing who Rourke is. And if Rourke can be this way, and not care so much about the reaction of the world, then that means that Wynan's whole rationalization for why he decided to lose his integrity was bogus. He didn't have to decide that integrity was impossible because the humiliation in front of others would be too much to take. And that means that then the whole resulting pursuit of power as compensation for that uh, was, was also without due cause. Okay, anybody wanna ask any other questions about the Wynand Rourke meeting and relationship? Because this is really in a lot of ways the most monumental part of this, of this reading. And I, I, I'd just be happy to spend a little bit more time on it if, if we wanted to. So anyone have further questions or comments they want to make about the Wine and Rourke uh, relationship? I'm looking at the chat here. Uh, Kate says they're soulmates. Wine has finally found an unbreakable man of great, of genuine greatness. He can't allow himself admiration. Uh, that's, yeah, I think that's a big part of what he sees in Rourke. And it's not just that he's un, uh, a genius. It's that it's more that he's unbreakable. And it's that he's unbreakable even when he's, someone's trying to break him for the reasons that we just discussed. So Sonali's asking, 
how Winan tries to break work specifically. And I, I do think just in case it's not clear, it's worth bringing this up and, and reiterating it. He tries to break Rourke in the same way that he's tried to break everyone else before Rourke by offering him a deal essentially too good to refuse. Say, you get to design my home exactly as you've designed it here on this blueprint. And you'll have all the work you could ever want in the future, but you have to do it the way of you know, classical good tastes in a Renaissance style. Uh, you, you essentially have to give up you know, your unique style of architecture and just conform. And Winan tries to break Rourke by offering him that and Rourke refuses. Yeah, and I noticed that Aditya in the chat also asked, why does Rourke like Wynand when he knows that he's a second-hander? Well, this is the part that I forgot to talk about in connection with the earlier question. We don't get that much about why Rourke responds to Wynand the way he does. The only thing we get is on page 548 is I mean, he tells Wynand that he was all ready to hate Wynand. He's never really hated anybody, but he was about to hate one and because of the things that Cameron told him and because of the Stoddard Temple campaign and so forth. And Rourke says he can't explain why he stopped hating one and why he feels the way he does toward him. Uh, obviously, it's enough of something about one that he's able to see it in one's face when they meet for the first time. This is not the man he expected when he went to meet one. And it turns out there's more to it than that too. I mean, they they have a, it's some of the same things that one liked about Rourke. They have a similar background. They had certain, a similar kind of youthful ambitiousness when they were young. One and still, I mean, obviously one and responds to Rourke's buildings. And I think there's more to it than that, but we're gonna be able to, uh, we're gonna be able to talk more about that in the final reading. Um, Merrill asked a question uh, that I can't raise here because it would involve going into spoilers. It's a, about a difference between the movie and the book, um, but we're going to leave that for maybe next time. Um, let's see now. Let's let's so let's let's go on to question two, Paul. Um, this sure. was what do we learn in this reading uh, about what motivates Ellsworth Tui, especially from his actions regarding. Cortland Holmes. Uh, and I'll just start off with a few things on this. And I, I'd be interested to hear uh, what people in the chat say about what motivates Ellsworth too, especially given what we learned from Cortland Holmes. Uh, in this pass, in this set of readings, chapter six is where we see Tui the most. And it's portraying a meeting between Tui and a circle of his associates. Uh, in previous scenes, the kinds of meetings he's had have been with intellectuals and artists, but notably what's going on here is it's a number of businessmen and their wives. But they're discussing a lot of the ideas that have been promulgated by the intellectuals and artists in Tui's circle. Uh, I think part of what's going on in this chapter, this is chapter six, is to illustrate the role of the ideas that Tui has been helping to support. Uh, what kind of impact they're having. And you see this in a number of ways. You see it especially in the way that the ideas are used by these characters to rationalize uh, certain kinds of, for lack of a better term, problems in their own lives. They, you'll remember that uh, phrase that we discussed last week from Wynand about how a quest for self-respect is a proof of a lack of it. You see a lot of that going on here. These people are able to gain a kind of false sense of self-respect from some of the ideas uh, that they're getting from Tui's cohorts. So Mitchell Layton is a particularly interesting example. He's the one who's an heir to a great fortune that he himself didn't earn. Uh, he hates the people who only care about his money and not about his ideas. Uh, Presumably one of the people who only cares about his money and not his ideas is his own wife, Eve Layton. She's portrayed as being that way. Um, he hates the working people, don't share his taste for collectivism. He especially can't stand Wynand because Wynand earned his own money, unlike he who inherited it. And so there's two ideas in particular from Tui and from Tui's 
uh, ilk that he seizes on. One is that people's place in life is just a matter of luck. This is the idea from the gallant gallstone that there's no free will. So if he's born with a fortune, he can't help it that he didn't get the chance to rise from the gutter and earn it for himself. So he can't be blamed for being a playboy in effect. Uh, and he also seizes on the idea that freedom is something realized through compulsion. This is this kind of paradoxical uh, idea that Tui is talking about at the very beginning of the chapter. He would rather take orders. He thinks that would be easier than nobody could blame him for having to, nobody could hold him responsible for the running of his business. And apart from that last idea I mentioned, which Tui articulates at the beginning of the chapter, everything else is ideas that are bubbling up from conversation because people read it in a column in the banner uh, from one or another of Tui's uh, intellectual associates. And he's sitting back surveying this whole thing. And at one point, page 557, he imagines the whole thing as these are keys on a keyboard that he's typing and he's looking at the results. He's in control. Uh, and he, at one point also on page 560, remembers how he told Dominique that he wanted to make the machine of society collapse by pressing on a weak spot. We start to get a sense of what the weak spot he's trying to press on here is, because it's also notable Mitchell Layton, who's under the influence of all these ideas, has, is the one who, sympathetic to Tui, has purchased a lot of the stock for the banner. Tui's encouraging him to hold on to it. And later we find out Wynand is pretty weak here too, because he's contemptuous and doesn't really think the ideas that he's been helping to sponsor are all that important. He doesn't realize what's going on uh, in the minds of all of these people. So what does this tell us uh, about what Tui's after? And I think, Paul, you wanted to say more about the scene with Keating uh, to this effect. Yeah, so because in the scene you're mentioning, Ben, it's mostly other people talking. You know, Tui very rarely interjects, but we get a direct insight into Tui's perspective uh, when he's talking with Peter. He is explicit when he's addressing Peter, and he says that, you know, he's talking about all the different ideas that he holds. One of those is that the old adage to divide and conquer might have its uses, but it remained for this century to discover the more potent formula of unite and rule. That's on pages uh, 567 and 68. And we really see through the rest of their conversation that Tui doesn't care about individual people. He says so explicitly, he views people as essentially all equal and interchangeable. They are, you know, they're cogs in a machine that he can run. And that it doesn't matter who it is, whether it's Peter Keating that he's using or Gus Webb or Mitchell Layton, or um, I'm blanking on her name, but the author of The Gallant Gallstone. Lois Cook. Uh, Lois Cook, there we go. Um, you know, it could be any one of these people, so long as they're still serving that same function that uh, that Tui wants them to serve, he's happy to use them until they're no longer uh, of value to him. Um, and he he uses an analogy or or a metaphor later in the conversation that I think is uh, is really powerful and insightful into his into his psychology psychological view on this you know when he's saying you can devote your entire life to pulling each single weed if it as it comes up and 10 lifetimes won't be enough for the job you can prepare your soil in such a manner by spreading a certain chemical let us say that it will be impossible for weeds to grow this last is faster i say weed because it is the conventional symbolism and will not frighten you so he's devoted himself to essentially getting rid of weeds for throughout his entire life in the field of art well and it's important also to notice what uh, the rest of the sentence the rest of the paragraph because it says the same technique of course holds true in the case of any other living plant you may wish to eliminate buckwheat potatoes oranges orchids or morning glories and i think the implication there is these are very far from weeds some of these are actually beautiful flowers 
and or necessary for survival like something like potato is actually food you know it's not it's not just you know, but especially the beautiful food. ones the ones yeah. that stand out mm -hmm. uh be, because this gives us further clue as to what his motivation is it's not because if you're trying to kill a weed right it's because you want the the it's you want the fruits and the flowers to grow you want the valuable things to to rise up he's not killing weeds to allow the valuable things to rise up uh it's something more nefarious than that and gretchen on facebook spoke to this issue somewhat she said uh Tui is motivated by power one telling line is when Tui says to keating why did i put you where you were to protect the field from men who would become irreplaceable why do you suppose i fought against for instance howard rourke uh and she says Tui also tells keating that he is still dealing with rourke indirectly with Cortland holmes he's able to do this through keating he likes to be the hand on the lever that makes many things happen and I think that's a good transition then to the, to the Cortland Holmes issue because it's an interesting question of what exactly it is. Uh, what kind of power is it that Tui is trying to exercise here? Is it just that he needs somebody to build a superlative housing project because he really cares about housing the poor? That's one way you might see it. Is the reason he wants power because he wants to lift all these people up in effect? Is it some other reason? Well, it's notice it's it's interesting that when Keating first approaches Tui, the way that Tui characterizes what he's looking for an architect to be able to do, uh, he says, "You might be able to turn the trick." Now that's a little bit vague. He might just be saying, you know, it's a, it's a tricky intellectual problem to solve, to be able to uh, design a building that's going to sell for $15 a month per unit, uh, given the budget and given the materials that are available. But once Keating, which we're going to talk about soon, goes to Rourke using his old tricks uh, and gets Rourke to design the building for him. And then he brings it back to Tui, passing it off as his Keating's own work. Tui's reaction here is important. He says, you've succeeded in what I've spent a lifetime trying to achieve in what centuries of men and bloody battles behind us have tried to achieve. I take my hat off to you, Peter, in awe and admiration. Now, Tui has not spent his lifetime trying to design housing projects. He's not spent his lifetime trying to find architects who can design housing projects. He's himself an art critic with various other intellectual ambitions. What has been the theme of all of the projects he's engaged in? Well, it's related to what he said to Keating earlier that he wanted to make the irreplaceable men, he wanted to push them out so that everybody else would get a chance. Well, he's not, you might then wonder, well, but now isn't, why, isn't he using Rourke? Isn't he relying on Rourke? Isn't this exactly what he didn't want to do? Well, but he's also succeeded in getting Rourke to work for the likes of Keating. He's succeeded in getting Rourke to submit his services, not only to Keating, but to Tui and to all the people who are working on this project. And I'll, I'll leave it there because that's a preliminary way of describing what he's doing. I think we'll find out even more uh, when we get to uh, the final section of the reading, but it's again helpful to think about the fertilizer analogy that he's not spreading fertilizer or he's not spreading the weed killer to kill the weeds. He's spreading it to kill the morning glories. Why would he want to do that? Does anyone have any further thoughts on that? Paul, did you want to add anything more to that? Anyone have questions in the chat they want to submit about Tui? And Stephanie says, Tui's been trying to rule the men of ability. Interesting question 
as to why, though. Why does he want to do that? What does he want to try to accomplish? Uh, is it just, well, the men of ability will build him better housing projects? Or is there something more going on there? Because he didn't want to spread that weed killer to make room for morning glories. Gretchen, you said, you're asking, does Tui know Rourke was behind Peter's successful design? You think he does. I mean, I think you have to assume something like that from his reaction, um, because if he were only reacting thinking that Tui, sorry, if he were only reacting thinking that Keating had designed this great building, this is not what Tui's been trying to do his whole life, learn how to design buildings like that. It's something else going on here. And I think we, I think your point there, Ben, is, is clear if you look at it and compare it to other sections of the book, when Dominique sees the sketch from uh, of Wynan's new home that work is going to build, she sees the sketch. She doesn't see the name. She knows exactly who did it. Yeah. So, it, you know, of course, for an art critic says. of which Dominique is and Tui is, they can tell the different styles of people's designs. And, and this building, remember, uh, Cortland Holmes, is Rourke's entirely. It's Rourke's design. He's not just altering the design Peter gave yeah. like he had in the past. This is Rourke. So of course, I think, I think it's very clear from the context of the novel that Tui knows explicitly that this is Rourke, that Rourke has been subjugated to this purpose and, and Tui feels a certain amount of success in that. Well, let's talk a little bit about Keating. We asked a question, how does Keating change in this reading? And why does he approach Rourke in the way he does? Why does he react, Catherine, react to Catherine as the way that he does? Uh, and part of that question is about change, but it's helpful to describe the ways that Keating changes against the backdrop of the ways he stays the same. Um, the first time we see him in this reading, he's, it's, it's true that things, his fortune has changed in that his uh, march of the centuries has failed and his firm is contracting and they're closing off uh, parts of their office. Uh, he's very unhappy. But in thinking about why he's unhappy, uh, in discussing things with his mother, for instance, his mother says, Petey, you've got to be happy. Otherwise, what else has my life been for? And this reminds him of a similar conversation he had with Guy Franken. And very interestingly, when he starts to realize the implications of the statement, he shuts his mind to thinking about them. This is something he's done many times in the past. He still doesn't want to grapple with the fact that, hey, if those people aren't getting any meaning from their life by living for others, uh, what does that mean about me? And then of course, using his old book of tricks facing these problems in life, his first source of support is to go to Tui to get the kind of reassurance that he gets from Tui. Uh, that's not why he gets reassurance from Tui is itself something that involves, uh, I think, a lot of mind shutting on his part. And that's something that we could talk about more. But the other reason he goes is because he wants a chance at Cortland. And then when he realizes he's not up to snuff on designing it, the other book of tricks item he uses is going to Rourke for help on the design. So, so far, same old Keating, but there are some changes and Paul, I think you noticed some of them. Yeah, there's definitely a change in Peter. And so I think it's first worth noting that he doesn't just go to work immediately after going to Tui. He tries very diligently to do the task of designing Cortland but he realizes that he can't do it. You know, he's not up to the challenge. He doesn't have the skill needed to fulfill the requirements of the job. And then he goes to Rourke, knowing full well that he cannot on his own deliver on the project, which, which I think is different than in the way he's approached Rourke in the past. Um, I'm thinking of the Cosmos Slotnik building. It's the one that stands out in my head. And I remember Keating going to Rourke and he's just kind of unsure about whether the project, whether he's, you know, submitted a good design and Rourke makes some small alterations for Keating. 
but here Chewie knows, or sorry, Keating knows explicitly that he can't deliver. And I think this knowing is the biggest change for Keating. You know, he can't really evade that, that fact any longer. And so, and it's, so he has to do it differently. It's not just knowing that he can't do Cortland. It's more than that. I mean, I think the most stunning recognition on his part is on page 575 where he says to Rourke, he, he says he admits it to himself and he admits it to Rourke that he's a parasite, that he's been a parasite all his life on Rourke and on all of the other architects down through the ages that he has, you know, whose designs he's, he's parasitized. Uh, and after making that recognition, I, I think that has an effect on Rourke because Rourke realized, no, something's changed here with Peter. And, you know, Peter, if you can just stop shutting your mind like you have before, if you can try to work with every mental effort you can to understand what's going on here, there's a moment you have here. And he, at one point he says, I'd sell my soul for Cortland. But when Rourke says, no, try to realize it's keeping your soul. That's important. And at that point, it looks like Keating does genuinely try to understand Rourke's reasons for wanting to design Cortland his own way, why that's the payment, his being able to actually do the work. He doesn't care about the money. He doesn't care about the fame. Uh, I think Keating that, really does understand Rourke's, uh, Rourke's motivation here, because otherwise I think Rourke would have turned him down if, Ke if Keating couldn't fully appreciate and understand what was required, essentially... Keating wouldn't have, it. if he wasn't able to understand, he wouldn't have been able to offer the payment that Rourke demanded. And so that understanding, I think, is genuine. Yeah, and it's not an accident that earlier in the same uh, scene or sequence, uh, Keating had also started painting again. This is, of course, what he had always wanted to do. Uh, it's what his mother derailed him from doing when he was young. So he understands on some level the importance of doing the thing you really want to do and enjoying the doing. Now, whether he's any good at it, unfortunately, is a different question. And, you know, Rourke tells him that it's too late. Uh, and I remember now that there was, this is, there's somebody who emailed a question. Um, what was, uh, Amre, I'm not sure if I am pronouncing it correctly, but he asked, why does Rourke think pity is such a monstrous emotion? And of course it's pity that Rourke feels uh, or something like pity that he feels toward Keating at the end when he tells Keating that it's too late. And I think this connects to some of the things that we've been discussing before Amre, because pity is painful to feel. It is painful to look at another person's failure, especially to not be able to do anything about it. And one of the characteristic traits of Rourke is that he doesn't take the, he doesn't take pain seriously. He doesn't look at the world, see all the people that are suffering. He doesn't even take his own pain seriously when he himself is suffering. And so pity, which is an emotion that sort of focuses you on the pain of another person, that doesn't fit Characteristic pity doesn't fit into Rourke's worldview. That doesn't mean he can't, you know, have sympathy for somebody and try to help them out. He does this very frequently, especially with someone like Stephen Mallory, even with Keating here. But to dwell on it and be sucked into it, that's not part of Rourke's worldview. And the fact that it isn't, that's part of the reason that he differs from people like Wine and, and Domini. Uh, so Gretchen had also shared a thought on the answer to this question. She says, Keating's reached a time when he can no longer lie to himself. He's finally honest with himself and with Rourke. Then he meets Katie again. He was always honest with her. It seems as if he could not control the need to be honest with her. Uh, he's clear about his feelings to her, but she's indifferent. Uh, she can't express her real emotion anymore. anymore. And so that's a good uh, opportunity then to transition to talking about Catherine. Paul, did you want to uh, say a few things? Sure. Um one thing that I thought was interesting is that Keating's mother brings Katie up um, earlier in, in the section before they meet. 
and, and says that, you know, you should, you should marry her. And I, I just found that interesting. But then when Keating meets her, she's so different than she was when, before he'd married Dominique. She seems, I don't know exactly how to describe it, kind of lifeless or empty, but she has this kind of mask or facade of happiness. And I don't know if mask or facade is the right way to frame it either, because she might even think that she is happy. It's, she's a very different person. And I think that is what's most unsettling to Peter because he's, I think he's looking at a future version of himself or, or what could be if, you know, if he kind of follows down the path that she went. It's noteworthy that she's become a lot more like Tui. She's got that same kind of sense of humor that nothing is too serious, that we can't be, we have to be grown up. We have to not have great desires anymore. That's something we'll maybe talk a little bit more about later, but it's noteworthy here that Keating's reaction to this is is a sign that there's been some change on his part, that he really has taken to heart some of the things that, that he's learned from interacting with Rourke, especially when he says it's the hardest thing in the world to do what we want and it takes the greatest kind of courage. I mean, what we really want is I wanted to marry you, not as I want to sleep with some woman or get drunk or get my name in the papers. Those things, they're not even desires. They're things people do to escape from desires because it's such a big responsibility really to want something. And, that point, even though it's coming from someone like Keating, is really important to remember when you're when you're thinking about some of the broader themes of the novel, some of the things we've discussed in the past about how, uh, you know, Winans' idea that the quest for self-respect is a proof of its lack. Well, these kinds of things that people pursue, uh, hedonistic pleasures, they're not really desires, they're escape from desires. You escape from uh, things to dull your pain. That's a way of reassuring yourself that you're living when maybe you're not. Uh, and it also tells us something more about what it really means to be selfish. There have been questions about whether Keating or Rourke is selfish. Well, the things that make it look like Keating selfish, wanting to get his name in the papers, wanting to get money, wanting to get some woman, are those really what makes someone selfish? We talked last week about what the self really is according to the to this author and according to many of the characters in this story you're getting a sense of that here in what keating is saying um, as you did also i think in the exchange between Wynand and rourke about how you own things in the world by saying yes or amen to them uh, when you really value them um, that's something we could talk more about but i want to leave at least a little time to say a few things about the last question um, the last question is what the story both uh, begins and ends with uh, this the reading uh, parts uh, chapters one through ten really begins and ends with and this is the question of springtime and youth these are motifs that appear frequently throughout this first half of part four how do they relate to the themes the author is developing uh, Paul you want to say a few things here sure I'll just note that broadly speaking in literature when when spring is brought up and brought up explicitly and purposefully it's regularly associated with an idea of rebirth or renewal. And that I think holds true when Rand is capitalizing on that here by showing Rourke's rebirth, his flourishing of his career, of his personal life. You know, he's gaining new friends, his friendship with uh, Wynand is flourishing. You know, he's seeing Dominique again, you know, someone he hasn't seen. He's, you know, seeing Stephen Mallory, all of his other friends and workers come to work with him at, while well, they, he's developing Cortland essentially. Um, and he's really coming into his own. And then you can contrast this because it's not springtime for everyone in this part, but it really is for Rourke. It's his flourishing, whereas it's contrasted with this fading away uh, for Peter Keating. His career had been in its spring, in its youth, in its real flourishing earlier in the novel and now is not, which I think heightens this you know, sense of spring for Rourke. Uh, but Ben, did you have more to say on? Yeah, uh, because there's so aspect? much. I actually wrote an essay on this topic once. If you if you 
look up uh, essays on Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead, which is edited by Robert Mayhew. That I have an essay on The Fountainhead and the Spirit of Youth. And it's all over this part of the book, especially, especially the, my favorite part of the book, which is the beginning of part four, the boy and the bicycle scene. The leaves streamed down, trembling in the sun, and it looked as if the forest were a spread of light boiling slowly to produce this color, this green rising in small bubbles, the condensed essence of spring. The young man hoped he would not have to die, not if the earth could look like this, he thought, not if he could hear the hope and the promise like a voice with leaves, tree trunks, and rocks instead of words. Uh, and it's, of course, right after this that he uh, sees Monadnock Valley for the first time. It gives him the courage to face a lifetime. Um, Rourke and his workers building Monadnock are also undergoing a kind of spring, except it's they start building in winter. And it says that they had lived through 12 months of spring. Uh, they remembered only the feeling, which is the meaning of spring. One's answer to the first blades of grass, the first buds on tree branches, the first blue of the sky, the singing answer not to grass, trees, and sky, but to the great sense of beginning, of triumphant progression, of certainty, and an achievement that nothing will stop, not from leaves and flowers, but from wooden scaffoldings, from steam shovels, from blocks of stone and sheets of glass rising out of the earth. They received the sense of youth, motion, purpose, fulfillment. Uh, when Keating meets Rourke, he says, Rourke looks so young when before he thought he was too old and serious. They comment on the connection between his youthfulness and his kindness, which paradoxically to Keating, it doesn't make sense because Rourke is also the most egotistical person that he knows doing his work his own way. So there's a connection there between youth and a kind of seriousness and a kind of what he calls egotism. And this is like selfishness. But I think what's most interesting about the springtime and youthfulness motif in this part of the book is how it relates to Wynand. Because, of course, we find out page 517 that it's from seeing Manadnock that Wynand first learns about Rourke. Uh, and it's what gives him the idea to have Rourke design this house, this house that he wants to build uh, because he's no longer afraid of a visible shape of his life. When the house is built, Dominique, or rather after he meets Rourke and has, you know, kind of has this, lo this love at first sight experience, Dominique notices that he's happy. He says that he feels light, like he's 30 years lighter. When he's sitting in Rourke's office, he says, I feel like I'm back in Hell's Kitchen looking at the stars even though there's a dump everywhere around me. Uh, after a, about a year after meeting Rourke, he notices his, that it's spring. He wonders if he has many left at the age of 55. He also is thinking about the meaning of his own life, just like that boy on the bicycle was. And he comes to the conclusion that the meaning of life has been my own life. I am the meaning. So there again is that connection between spring and youthfulness, and a kind of selfishness. And then, just like the boy on the bicycle, Wynan sees the house that Rourke has built for him, just like the boy saw Monadnock Valley. And he's got a sense of childish wonder. He's amazed that's come into existence, just like the boy asked Rourke, is that thing real? It's not a movie set or something like that. And that's where they then have their exchange about what is the meaning of life. And Wynan says, after Rourke picks up this stick and breaks it, is it your strength? Which speaks somewhat to his view that what's important in life is power over others. But Rourke corrects him and says, no, it's your work, your work done your way. So springtime and youth and seriousness and selfishness are connected, but in Rourke's view in a very particular way. And it leaves one to wonder, Wynand here at age 55, suddenly rediscovering his youth because of Rourke, unfortunately never came across Rourke as the young boy on the bicycle did. He was never given the courage to face a lifetime as Rourke gave to that boy. We wonder then how might Wynand's life have been different if he had met someone like Rourke 
or made decisions like Rourke made when he was that age. And uh, this is now put, setting us up for the last and final set of conflicts whereby the story of the Fountainhead will reach a climax and resolve itself and, uh, and we will see how this all turns out. Uh, so we're out of time, unfortunately. Uh, we got some good questions from people this week. I'm sorry, again, we weren't able to answer all of them. Um, but uh, like I said, next time, not next week, because we're canceling it next week, but two weeks from today, uh, we are going to not only discuss the final reading, um, but also uh, take an, set aside an hour for questions. So I'll just uh, put this up on the screen. Uh, thanks, everyone, again, for joining us to this point. We will see you on Friday, May 22nd, where we will discuss part four, chapters 11 through 20, the end of the Fountainhead. That's pages 600 to 694 in your mass market edition. Uh, and also devote a whole hour just to your questions and we'll give the best answers that we can to them. So thanks everyone again. Uh, this was great. Talk to you again soon. Hope to see some of you next week at Ocon. <laughs>